If you're looking for a ransom, I don't have money. But what I do have is a very particular set of skills. Skills acquired over a long career, which make me a nightmare for people like you. So I propose this thinking for you. There's no right answer, there's no right or wrong here. It's simply this. When you are coming across videos here in this space, and there are a great number of photographic channels, and they are all with merit. I don't make this statement saying that a reviewer is superior to a photographer, nor is a photographer superior to a reviewer. I don't, that's not what I'm here to say. What I'm here to try and expose and shed light on is you're actually getting a completely different approach to the problem at hand. G'day everybody, how are you going today? It is so very good to see you. Thank you for joining me today. Now at the start of each video, I'm actually going to outline who I am and where I'm coming from so that there'll be absolutely no confusion as to who I am and how I represent and see the world. I just want to also start by saying uh, I've made a whole video about this, but I believe it's impossible to exist without bias. Our entire lives feed our potential for bias. And as I'm here on YouTube as a professional who's been making money from photography for 30 years, I have had a, an astonishing amount of experiences that have created a set of biases. So I just want to say that up front. My name is Matt Irwin. I have been a photographer for 30 years and I have used cameras like my father's Ricoh, a Pentax, Nikon, uh, Mamiya RB67, Bronica, Sony, Canon, Hasselblad, uh, GoPros, DJI cameras, oh, and Kodak, yes, Kodak. So some of the larger names that I've never used at all, Fuji, Olympus, Leica, that might be it. Let me know if I've missed anything. So of the big brands we see today and some older ones as well, I've used a lot. It's super important to me that the gear that I have is simply based on my use case. It's not based on brand loyalty. Obviously an affiliation with a brand gives you upgrade paths, it gives you accessories, and obviously in the photographic world, your lenses mount. So I don't see that as a bias. I see that actually as a financial constraint that you have to work around or with or not. You can throw it all away and hit reset and lose some money. But I don't see it as a bias because you kind of have no choice. Once you're in an ecosystem, you've got to make it work for you. And as a professional, I've got to make it work for me within the optimal use case I can. You may well find that a photographer is, uh, their use case is not knocking up against their equipment. That then simply becomes a financial decision as to whether you want to trade use case, workflow, time, outcomes, results, all of that sort of stuff versus money. To back to where I was, I'm a professional. I've been doing this a very long time. I've been self-employed since I was 19. I have not worked for anybody else. Prior to that, I did work at the MCG, which is a massive 100,000 seating stadium here in the city of Melbourne, where Aussie Rules is played. And that's it. Nothing since then, just self-employed. I've got a lot, of, a lot of knowledge, a lot of information, and it's not, it's not literally just about camera specs. That's the thing. It's actually about how does a camera work within a business? What are some of the constraints when you've got to offset business realities with camera acquisition, gear acquisition? And then as a professional, what do you actually need to be, to be confident that you can turn up on location 
and your equipment won't let you down. That's critical. I've done shoots where the day costs $100,000 to be there. Talent, location, travel, catering, makeup artists, wardrobe, lighting people, etc. One thing is to talk about a camera on a spec sheet. Another thing is for a camera to actually not let you down under that sort of pressure. And that's a lot of pressure. So you have to be a real believer in the camera in your hand. That is why when you get your information from say an online reviewer slash influencer who derives the majority of their income actually from their influencing, their reviewing, versus when you get your information from a working photographer, you're actually getting two completely and utterly different perspectives. The camera in my hand, the camera that I look at the spec sheets, the camera that I choose to buy has to perform in the real world. The camera that a reviewer might talk about and run through the specs and whatever else, they are not applying that prism to it. Not only do they not get in the trenches and do this day in, day out for years on end, but they don't do it for a client who's putting a hundred grand on the line and they can guarantee failure or not because they haven't had to do it. They've never tried it. They've not, they've not been in that situation. So I think it's a profoundly different experience when listening to people that use and work with equipment as part of their profession. So it's always mission critical for those people as opposed to people who review for money. And the cameras are actually not mission critical. And cameras are way more than the spec sheet. There's, there's so many layers to it, which includes things that are literally not on the spec sheet, like legacy. And I want to present an analogy. If that was all too much words, I want to present a, 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 an analogy of how I think this is clearly different. And cars is a great way of doing it. There's a fantastic television show been very successful globally. It is called Top Gear. Now Top Gear have this fantastic segment where they will get an everyday person and they will get a professional driver to drive the same car around the same track. And they do it over and over again with different types of people some who are kind of um, amateur drivers, as in amateur racing drivers, and some who are just drivers. And these guys will throw the car around the track and get a result. And then you have all these other people with various levels of experience, and some have done, you know, uh, semi-professional driving or enthusiast driving, and some are just couldn't care less about driving. And you can see, as they run around the track, the differences between how the professional driver that does it and how the non-professional driver does it. In other words, the mileage of the vehicle, how they choose to throw it around the track, how they choose to exploit the gears, the brakes, the cornering, the handling, etc., etc. all those metrics and specifications, on and on it goes. The professional driver who does this for a living and getting a certain result because they're a professional will approach this thing and do it completely different to a non-professional driver. Now, this uh, example is not an exact simile. It's not an exact uh, comparison. But what it clearly shows us is that a professional who, like me, might have had 30 years behind the wheel, they know some of the tricks of getting around some of the hard stuff, and they are going to push the tolerances of this vehicle to absolutely screaming breaking point. And they know where that lies. They can find it quickly because they understand what the car's doing, etc., etc. A person who's not a professional driver, they can't push the car to the limits, they can't take it to the edge, they don't know how to do it, and they're just simply not gonna get the same result. So I propose this thinking for you. There's no right answer, there's no right or wrong here. It's simply this. When you are coming across videos here in this space and there are a great number 
of photographic channels. And they are all with merit. I don't make this statement saying that a reviewer is superior to a photographer, nor is a photographer superior to a reviewer. I don't, that's not what I'm here to say. What I'm here to try and expose and shed light on is you're actually getting a completely different approach to the problem at hand. So like the cars being flung around the track on top gear, the professional driver has a very specific set of skills and can do it extraordinarily differently to the non-professional driver. As to the professional photographer will, a comp will apply a completely different set of tools and parameters to how they look at a camera and a camera's ecosystem than a professional reviewer. I think it's super critical and it's incumbent upon you. That means it's your responsibility to know who you're watching. Are uh, you watching a professional reviewer? They make the majority of their income out of reviewing. Or are you watching a professional photographer? They make the majority of their money out of photography. That's just a rule of thumb. Obviously, that can be a bit of a slippery sliding scale. But it's incumbent upon you. It's up to you to find that out. Work out who this person is, what their channel is about, and then you will realize as you work out who's who, you'll then understand where they're coming from. And you will understand at that point that they come from completely different places. The way they assess, the way they drive the track, the way they push their equipment, the way they push their car. It's going to be completely different. So what you see and hear come out of their mouth, those two types of online photography channels are gonna look and sound very different. Just watch four or five videos and get a sense of actually who they are. And in the case of someone like me, not only can you watch videos, you can go to my website, my Instagram, my Facebook, and you can actually Google me online and see me in the newspaper. You can find out a lot about me. I think, I think it's really important to know who you've decided to converse with in the online space. We all need to be respectful of each other. So why are online photographic channels like Top Gear? Well, just like in Top Gear, we've got professional drivers and non-professional drivers running around a track and they will get completely different outcomes and they will use their gear completely dif dif differently. It is the same in YouTube. In YouTube, we have people who are professional reviewers, but not professional photographers, yet they talk about stuff that's completely in the realm of professional photographers. So those two groups are going to have completely different approaches to how they look at camera companies and ecosystems and equipment. And as I said, it's incumbent upon you to understand who you're listening to and then realize they're going to have completely different approaches. If you watch a TV show, if you read a book, spend some time with it, understand it, and then you know who you're listening to and what it's all about. Okay, everybody, well, this is just a philosophical update on how I think you, the viewer, can help to have clarity on what it is you're actually looking at. And I cannot, I cannot stress enough that really every single channel has some degree of bias. I think it's almost impossible. No, no, I do think it's impossible to have zero bias because everybody has had a continuum of life. I've had a lifetime of experiences and they are a certain set of experiences, completely different. There is nobody who has had the same experience I've had. That experience creates a certain version of me. And in various interpretations, that is bias. That is a bias. So it is impossible to watch a channel like this and it not have bias. I'm Australian. That creates bias. I'm a man. That creates bias. I've worked with film. That creates bias. I've owned many different brands of cameras. That creates bias and some bias and some bias is positive bias anyway you get my point as always it has been so good to be here with you today so very good to see you if this is your first time here gosh 
So good to meet you and I would love to see you again. So please subscribe, please share, please like. It really does help get the word out there. And if you'd like to see over 250 episodes right now, you can just click down there. All right.